Hi, hello, what's up? It's Emma from Bean Bad Books. So it looks like we're gonna have to do another rapid fire book wrap up, this time for the month of January. In the month of January, I read a kind of terrifying amount of books for me. I read in total 12. I'm not going to talk about four of them in this wrap up. And that's because the four of them that I'm not going to talk about follow a certain theme that you will find out about later. So fortunately, that only leaves eight for me to talk about, but that is still kind of a lot. And it's been a while since I read them. I'm filming this in late February. It's been a really bad couple of months, guys. So I really just wanted to try to get this out at least before the end of February. Maybe it's going to be early March. And then I'm immediately going to have to do a February book wrap up about this. After this, I mean. I'm considering reworking the structure of my wrap up videos just because I feel like I get bogged down because I never have time to film one. And then I have to film one because I have to talk about all of the books that I just read and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I would also feel weird not talking about the books that I read every month because I feel like that's sort of the core of a, of a booktube channel, right? So anyway, eight books. I'm gonna go. First book I'm going to talk about is I think the only one for which I have a physical copy, so I will hold it up. People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. Can I like stand it here? Is that weird? I don't know, it's a little weird. I'm gonna hold it. So this book is one that I know a lot of people really, really love. It's gotten so much love on booktube and on Goodreads. People who don't like anything really like it. With Cindy liked it, if that tells you anything. She's known for not liking stuff. I thought this was a perfectly charming romance novel that honestly to me wasn't that exceptional and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why I thought that. So if you somehow don't know what this book is about, it's a friends to lovers story. The protagonist Poppy and her best friend Alex, they've been friends for a really long time and they take these vacations together every single year. Poppy has become a travel writer over the course of their friendship so she actually got her start doing that from the vacations that they took together. And they've never dated, but there's always been this kind of tension between them. And for the last two years, they actually haven't spoken. But Poppy really wants to mend things between them. And so she decides to go on one last vacation with Alex in the hopes that this will potentially mend their relationship. I did like several things about this book. I thought the banter between the two leads was really on point. It was very snappy. I think dialogue is one of Emily Henry's real strengths. I also like the whole conception of Emily Henry's MO, which is to sort of write romances about writers and people who were into literature, which of course is sort of my thing. So uh, that's why I'll probably read her next book coming out. The first thing that didn't work for me was the fact that this is a first person POV from only Poppy. I very rarely read romance novels in which this is the case. Usually there's kind of a close third person that alternates between the two love interests. But in this case, we get obviously a whole lot from Poppy, but really nothing from Alex for a really, really long time. And that didn't allow me to connect with him as a character in the way that I wanted to. He seemed like a love interest rather than an equal character in this story that was really just Poppy's. Another thing I didn't like was that a lot of the side characters in this book are basically just vehicles uh, for Poppy and Alex to explore different parts of their relationship and they didn't really feel like real people. And I know you're about to say, but wait, it's a romance novel. That's kind of the whole point of a romance novel is it's about the relationship between the two leads. You don't read a romance novel for side characters. What are you doing? But the problem with this is, and I'm going to be very careful about this because it could be considered a spoiler. The title of this is People You Meet on Vacation. And I'm just going to say that the people that they meet, Alex and Poppy, on the vacation are going to become important later in the book. But because those people didn't seem at all memorable to me because they were just these very stock characters that only seem to be in the book because you can't literally have a book with only two characters. Actually, I guess you can, but romance novels don't tend to do that. The narrative focuses so much on Alex and Poppy, but it really doesn't treat those characters as significant until the plot requires them to be significant. So then the, the conclusion of the book really doesn't have the narrative weight that I felt it should have. I'd have loved to see more of the characters. Poppy has two brothers who have a group chat with her, and she's always making reference to their weird projects. Like one time they wanted to make an R-rated Smurf musical, which sounded hilarious to me. I honestly kind of wish the romance novel was about one of them finding love. I also just felt the pacing was a little bit off. The book alternates between present day, which is the when Alex and Poppy are going on this vacation after having spent two years apart, and then the different vacations they take over the years. And I can tell that Emily Henry has a love for travel and that she's really interested in depicting all of these places, but 
I felt like the way in which she was doing it kind of slowed the narrative down because she was mainly only doing it as a backdrop for the rest of the story. And so it felt like she was rushing us through all of these places. And I was like, I cannot, I cannot keep all of these details straight in my head. Like, I'm here for a romance novel. <laughs> I did think this was fun, but I can't quite get on the hype train. I'm really sorry about that. That's just how it is. Next up, I'm going to talk about a book that was really, really worth the hype for me. And that was The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by... What's her name? Taylor Jenkins Reid. <laughs> I had the audiobook narrators written down. I just didn't have the author's name written down. Well, I started reading this book when I was very sick in early January. I hit play on the audiobook, um, thinking I'd listen to it for a couple of hours. And three days later, I had listened to the entire thing and I didn't even speed it up. So that tells you how good it was. The setup for the book, in case you have not read it, I know many people have, is that Evelyn Hugo is this very, very famous movie star who's in her late 70s, and she has these like Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor kind of vibes. She's ready to spill all the tea about her life, especially the seven husbands that she had. And the person she's picked to tell her story to is this virtually unknown reporter named Monique Grant, and no one knows exactly why she's picked her. There are two main storylines. Most of the book is Evelyn telling her own story in her own words, and then there are intermittent chapters in which Monique is commenting on the story and in many cases applying the lessons she learns from Evelyn in her own life, which is really interesting to watch. Taylor Jenkins Reid is a background in film production and I think that really shines through in this book. I really felt while I was reading this like I was inside a really juicy Hollywood biopic, except maybe one that actually deserved the Oscar it got. Evelyn Hugo felt like such a realistic character. Even if I hadn't read the audiobook, I would have felt like it was truly her voice telling her story directly to me. The other characters in this book are also incredibly well realized. I almost googled the name of one of Evelyn Hugo's friends before I realized that this, that this person never actually existed. Also, I just want to address right now that many people have neglected to mention in their reviews that Evelyn is bisexual because a lot of people felt that that was a spoiler because it's not revealed immediately at the beginning of the book. However, I've seen some really compelling arguments for making sure that that's mentioned early on because LGBTQ readers deserve to know if a book they're picking up is going to have a strong representation, especially in a protagonist. Books Are My Social Life has a really good video explaining this. I'm going to link it in the description. The only reason I think I wouldn't give this a perfect five stars, that's why it's getting a four and a half, is occasionally I felt that the author is a bit too explanatory with, with, with the points that she was trying to make. She goes on a lot about, through Evelyn, about like the nature of bisexuality a few times, and it gets to the point where it's just a little bit didactic. There are also a couple of points where I felt like the narrative was more hewing towards high drama than something that would have actually been logical. But honestly, that didn't happen very often. I still thought this book was amazing. The audiobook was really wonderfully produced. I think Alma Cuervo read Evelyn, uh, Robin Miles read Monique, and Julia Whalen read a couple of snippets from gossip magazines. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that People You Meet on Vacation is getting three stars. Slip my mind, sorry. Next book, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. And honestly, the most accurate thing I can say about what I thought of this book is that it was in fact completely fine. I gave it three stars. This book I think is what people mean when they say that unlikable characters can be really fun to read. Eleanor Oliphant is one of the best written unlikable characters I think I've seen in a contemporary novel. Her childhood was quite difficult for reasons that will be revealed later. And she hasn't ever had a lot of interaction with other people. She's very brusque, always says what she thinks, even if what she thinks is a bit rude. And she has this very educated and uh, sophisticated way of speaking, um, but at the same time doesn't know very basic things like popular songs and things that people eat at McDonald's. The book really gets going when Eleanor is coming home from work and she notices a man collapse in the street and she and her colleague Raymond help him and get him to the hospital. They form a friendship with Sammy, who's the man who collapsed, and also with each other. And through the rest of the book, Eleanor starts to come out of her shell a little bit, interact more with other people, and address some of the trauma from her childhood. Although I think Eleanor as a character is really strong, uh, I think the author does a good job of not quite crossing that line between um, flawed into incredibly irritating. I do think the end of the book collapses a little bit because I think that the trauma that Eleanor was put through as a kid, although it's foreshadowed at the beginning, it has a lot of plot holes by the end. It seems like Gail Honeyman was just kind of heaping 
different traumas onto Eleanor and then they were resolved really quickly at the end it seemed. I also thought most of the characters that weren't Eleanor and Raymond were pretty thin and most of them were just kind of types which I didn't think worked well for this particular book. If you have triggers for child abuse, alcoholism, or sexual assault I would consider skipping this one but otherwise I would in fact recommend it as a good portrait of an unlikable character who manages to overcome her traumatic past. Next up is the Jane Austen Book Club by Karen Joy Fowler. I wanted to pick this one up because A I love Jane Austen and B I was really sick and needed something that was a little bit more chill I suppose. And C I had read a short story by Karen Joy Fowler a couple years ago and was really impressed with it and wanted to see what she would do with a contemporary novel. I was kind of surprised by this book. It wasn't quite what I thought it would be. It's a lot less focused on the book club these six characters are a part of than I thought it was going to be. I was expecting a lot more discussion about the club meetings and Jane Austen, opinions on the books, which we do get, but it's also kind of a deep dive into the, each of these six characters' lives. And this makes a narrative kind of disjointed, though often quite moving. Karen Joy Fowler has a gift for ironic wit that I think a lot of people who write narratives that are adjacent to Jane Austen or based in Jane Austen don't quite have and so it was really refreshing to see that here. And I really liked spending time with most of these characters even though the plot was a little bit slow. Except for Bernadette, somebody shut that woman up please. I've also been in a couple of book clubs and I thought that the discussions were pretty spot on and funny. I just wish that there were more of that. We just got a couple pages in each chapter. I also think each character's ending was wrapped up a little too neatly by the end but that's just me. I do, however, have to plug the hilarious discussion questions that were at the end of this book, and I think a lot of people might miss them if they were only going to read until the end of the actual story. But Karen Joy Fowler did this really interesting thing where she had each character write a couple of discussion questions for this novel, and it's very meta, and each question is very reflective of what the character would think. One of the characters, Allegra, is known for pointing out uncomfortable truths about Jane Austen's time that a lot of the older women in the group don't want to think about, and so this is one of her questions. In the Jane Austen book club, I take two falls and visit two hospitals. Did you stop to wonder how a woman who supports herself making jewelry affords health insurance? Do you think we will ever have universal coverage in this country? Allegra's out here speaking truth to power, we like to see it. Prudy is a French teacher and she's and she'll sometimes say things in French that nobody understands. So one of her questions is in French and then it says agree or disagree. I don't speak French, so I'm not going to attempt to butcher this so that you can <laughs> see it. Here's a question from Grig. If Jane Austen were alive today, would she be considered a romance writer? You know, I think that's a really good question and I might make an entire video on this actually. Sylvia is a woman who is going through a divorce during the book and here's one of her questions. Do you ever wish your partner had been written by some other writer, had better dialogue, and a more charming way of suffering? What writer would you choose? A more charming way of suffering. I can't. So I hope that gives you a sample of how funny this author can be. I did have some pacing issues with the book, but I'm going to give it three and a half stars. I really enjoyed it and I'm hoping to read more by Karen Joy Fowler. Next up is a book I frankly did not get much enjoyment out of, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, and that is Dancing Arabs by Syed Kashua. I picked up this book because I'm participating in a reading challenge in which I read 15 different translated books over the course of a year from 15 different languages. One of the languages was Hebrew. I had a hard time finding a book translated from Hebrew at my local library, but I eventually chose this one. It's a satirical coming of age story about a young Arab man living in Israel gets a chance to enter a Jewish school and tries to erase his Palestinian heritage. I appreciate the cultural divide that this story is depicting and the ending was really hard hitting because it brought back something from early on in the book that hadn't been discussed for a long time. But for me as a reader, the style of this story, I just had a really hard time with it. I often have a hard time with hardcore satire because I often enjoy reading books with interesting characters and satirical character portraits are often very thin because they're more meant to represent types and not people. I also thought here that characters popped up and went away at weird points and I didn't really understand why this character would come up and we'd talk about them and then they'd go away and then we'd get another one that we really should have known about for longer. I also didn't find the writing as funny as I'd hoped uh, and that might be due to the fact that it was in translation. Maybe it's more overtly funny in the original Hebrew. Translator's name was Miriam Schlesinger. I've never read anything else that she's translated and I don't know much about Hebrew so I don't know if this was an 
accurate or a good translation necessarily. To be honest, I mainly finished the book because it fulfilled a prompt for my reading challenge and actually fulfilled another prompt for another reading challenge I'm in, which is to read a book by a Palestinian author. I liked some of the cultural details, but ultimately I just don't think this book was for me. Oh man, I really don't want to talk about this one. Next, I read Where the Drowned Girls Go by Shauna McGuire, and it was my least favorite Wayward Children book yet. Honestly, that's saying something because I really didn't like the previous book in this series. Uh, I think it was called Across the Green Grass Fields. I was hoping that this one, which was going to feature some of my favorite characters, would be better, and it was worse. I gave the previous Wayward Children book two stars. I was hoping this one would be better. It was one and a half. In this book, Cora, one of the characters from previous books, is suffering from post-traumatic stress due to the trauma she suffered in book five. And so she is hoping to transfer to another school for children who have traveled between worlds, which is called the White Thorn Institute, because she's heard that their approach is a bit more, is a bit tougher, I suppose. And uh, she's hoping that that will squash these horrible feelings out of her. But of course, the school is corrupt. Uh, they're not running it properly. Everybody's sad, whatever. Yeah, that sounds harsh, but I really didn't like this. The book doesn't explain anything is the problem. They don't explain why people's parents allow them to stay in this horrible school and never want to visit, including characters whose parents we know love them from previous books. We get a bunch of new characters that we don't spend any time with, and so I don't connect with them. For a really short book, the plot goes in circle after circle until I'm not really sure what we're doing here anymore. The dialogue, more than in any other book, seems to be almost this like alliterative free verse poetry stuff. Everything that comes out of a kid's mouth seems like it's it should be coming out of like somebody at a college literary magazine poetry beat competition. Not that I know what any of those are like. The twist at the end also could have added a lot of texture to the world, but it's just so clumsily handled that it just seems like an afterthought. Also, where is Cade? Cade is my favorite character. I read this book hoping that I would see Cade. He is in like two pages and then he is gone. All that being said, Shauna McGuire is still a decent writer when she's not writing cutesy armchair philosophical dialogue. It was nice to see a couple of my favorite characters again at least, so this isn't getting a straight one star, but it's pretty close. I did listen to the audiobook. It was read by Whitney Johnson. I didn't love her reading, but maybe I just hated the story so much that it just seemed like she was doing a bad job. I won't hold it against her for now. Next up is a book that I didn't dislike as much, but was also a little bit of a disappointment for me, and that is Take Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. Also listen to the audiobook for this one. It was read by Ioni Butler, and I thought that she did a pretty good job reading. The book overall, though, I would give two and a half stars. Maybe I'm judging this a little bit too harshly because I love Get a Life Chloe Brown so much, I, but I just felt the romance here was a little bit too sappy, sickly sweet, and it stayed in that place for a really long time. I felt like the plot wasn't really moving. I did like that Danny Brown and the love interest in this book, Zafir, were friends before the relationship started. I think that added an interesting dynamic to their relationship. I think I would have preferred it if they'd stayed friends for a little bit longer and done more of a slow burn. I, I felt like we were just sort of sitting here like, okay, what's wrong with this? This is a romance novel. We're supposed to be seeing some, some tension or at least some development here. I also really liked that this book emphasized that both of these characters have things going on outside of the romance. Danny's really dedicated to her academic work as a literature PhD student. That's actually been a problem for her in the past with past relationships because her partners feel like they're she's ignoring them. And Zafir used to be a professional rugby player and is now running a youth support organization and that's also a very cool journey for him. So I didn't completely dislike this. Um, I bumped it up a little bit because I did like some of the character development. I just didn't, I just didn't like the romance development. This is a romance book, like come on. <laughs> I have heard that people who aren't huge fans of Danny Brown tend to like Eve Brown, so I am pretty excited to read that one now. Last of all, here it is my five-star read for January, Writers and Lovers by Lily King. I picked up this book because I had heard a lot of good things about it from different publications and reviewers, and it also looked kind of similar to a book I loved in 2020, which was Less by Andrew Sean Greer. I actually would call this, in a lot of ways, sort of the female counterpart to a story like Less. I think if you like one, you're gonna like the other. And so I thought I, I thought that this was going to be my cup of tea, but I didn't expect this degree 
of adoration for it. This is a book in which the characters love literature so much that it permeates their entire being. These, these characters are MFA students, books are name dropped all the time, they're very literary, they're also very very poor, their sentences are very poetic in, the, in that sort of crafted way of MFA people, which is definitely my kind of thing. I also really loved how this book celebrates joy and happiness. It is a book that is very difficult to read at times. It has a lot of difficult situations in it because Casey, the protagonist, is trying to write this novel. She's taking a really long time on it. She's basing it actually off of her mother's experiences living in Cuba. Her mother has since passed away, which is another huge part of this book. She has a rough relationship with her dad, she just broke up with somebody, and she has these two new guys in her life that she isn't quite sure what to do with. Both of those guys are extremely well fleshed out in a way in which love interests in novels often aren't unless they're romance novels. And this includes even the children of one of the love interests who are so funny and such a focal part of the story while at the same time being realistic as children, which is really rare. I related to Casey in a lot of ways. I didn't go through an MFA program, but I'd good, I went through an MA program in translation, literary translation. Casey also has traveled to Spain and she speaks Spanish and she has this really amazing uh, insight about how she is losing the language that it took her so long to cultivate unless the, unless she finds someone to use it with and the boyfriend she lived there with is gone now so she really doesn't have anyone. There's also this hilarious scene where she has to write a thank you note to someone and because she's a trained writer she agonizes over every little detail and it takes her like eight drafts and as someone whose mother routinely yells at her to finish her thank you notes for her Christmas gifts already. I can relate to that. So in a nutshell, I love this book's insights on loss and on language and on writing and on friendship and on life. I know that this book isn't perfect. I know one or, one or two of the characters are maybe a bit stereotyped. They could be a little bit better fleshed out. I do have a couple of qualms about the ending, but I don't care. I love it anyway. Five stars. So there we are. We finally made it to the end of my January book wrap up. I hope I can get this out before February is over at least. But if I can't, uh, I guess you'll just enjoy it in March and I'll have a book wrap up for February coming soon. I read fewer books because that month is very short, so shouldn't take me as long to get it together. Thank you as always for watching. Bye.